Welcome to the third edition of PlatformCon. This time I want to explain why successful platforms rely on a combination of architecture, domain-driven design, automation, and the whole thing done wholesale. So when I talk to customers why they're building platforms, we generally get a statement like the following, which could be summarized as, well, platforms are there to solve all my problems. And although Dilbert has not has fallen a little bit out of favor recently, I call this buzzword bingo. So part of my talk is about how do we make sure that platforms actually fulfill these kind of lofty ambitions. Now, funnily, as software people, we often believe or always pretend to believe that we invented pretty much everything. Now, luckily, that isn't always true. And that isn't true for platforms because we have quite a bit of history we can fall back onto. And that history is about half a century ago when automotive manufacturers realized that building an entire car model from scratch is highly in economical. Right, it takes a long time and heavy investment. So what they started to do is use a platform model where they made a base platform and on top of that platform, they could produce many different models. For example, Volkswagen did this and on the same chassis, they started with a Golf, a Passat, later an A4, right, a hatchback, a sedan, a wagon, and all these varieties on the same platform. Now, the ideas of having a common or shared element isn't entirely new, but platforms have an important nuance here. And that is that by splitting the vehicle into two parts, you get more innovation on both sides. You have better economies of scale in the chassis for innovations like anti-lock brakes and sequential gearboxes because you can amortize this across more models. But equally important on the top, you can afford to have more different models. So the goal here wasn't to make more uniform cars. The goal was here to have better economies of scale at the bottom, but have more model diversity address more customer groups at the top. And that's an important lesson for us in IT when we build platforms. The classical sort of failed approach was like, hey, I build the common elements only once and then I just need to put this tiny tip on top of the pyramid and everything will be fine. And that looked good on PowerPoint, but it never worked well in reality. So platforms are different. Platforms are not a pyramid. Platforms are there to reduce complexity and harmonize, but the goal of that harmonization is to allow more diversity on top. Operating systems are great examples of that. We only use a small handful of operating systems these days. They're highly standardized, but on top, we build whatever we like. So our first important lesson here is if you build a platform, don't try to anticipate every use case. If you do that, you're building a shared reusable library kind of thing, right? But you're probably not building a platform. So the test I always like folks to apply is that if you build a platform, somebody should have built something on top that you did not anticipate, something that surprised you. If that is not the case, you run the risk of having built the pyramid as opposed to have built an actual platform. So with that preamble, let's look at how we make that work. What's so unique about platforms and what does your platform need to look like to make this work? And as always, it's easier to start with a bad example. So when we build reusable things, we are always tempted to name things after the ingredients because as engineers, we build the ingredients and we're proud of them. So my going joke is that if engineers had named the car, they would have called it you know, the piston, crankshaft, gear, wheel, assembly, singleton, factory, something. Now, that isn't a good abstraction because that is what we call composition. That is the sum of many technical pieces. What's interesting here is not the technical pieces that are underneath, but the purpose of this thing. And the purpose of this thing is that it can move itself. And that's why it's called an automobile. Now, we might joke at this, but if you look at other platforms that are sort of a Jira, Confluence, and Jenkins you know, combination, that is more like piston, gear, shaft, shaft, wheel assembly. So what we 
realize is that composing itself is not an abstraction. It might be convenient, it might be totally useful, but if it requires you to understand the base vocabulary underneath, then by definition it cannot be an abstraction. So if you want to reduce cognitive load and find abstractions, we need to try a little bit harder. So here's an example I see all the time. So people building a platform saying yeah, for compliance reasons and consistency reasons, I don't want you to make all the settings that are available in the cloud. One of my favorite services is DynamoDB, but logic applies to most cloud services. So I go and say, hey, I'm going to fix some settings for you, right? I might give you only certain availability zones. Um, I require application, many other things I might do. And I say like, hey, this platform is great for you because you don't have to set all these settings by yourself. The problem is what seems to be a better database for the platform builder appears to be a lesser database for the user because like, why am I getting a 80% DynamoDB? Why can't I have all settings. So this is a hard sell to your teams. And the metaphor I like to apply here is that, well, if you think a thousand piece puzzle is a little bit difficult for somebody to solve, taking a hundred pieces out is not going to make their life easier. It's actually going to make their life harder. So again, this doesn't pass our test of actually providing abstractions, right? This is just setting some defaults and this abstraction is totally leaky. You're not making people's lives easy. So I hinted at operating systems. So operating systems do a very good job here, right? A disk like a storage medium is either on a tape or it's like sectors on a disk. That's a low level access. Now, an operating system doesn't give you a better way to access the disk sectors and maybe defaults things to physical drive zero. No, that's not what an operating system does. An operating system places an abstraction on top. File systems, hierarchies, directories, um, reading from streams, that is the higher level vocabulary. So that is why operating systems are actually good platforms. They hide the details and still give you the flexibility to build many things on top. So naming here is important and sticking with our car theme, right? Commonly the pedal on the right we call the gas pedal, at least in the US, and you find out that that is a poor abstraction, right? Because in an electric car, hopefully you don't have gas more properly. And in the UK, this is called the accelerator, named after the purpose, not after the ingredients. And you can test this abstraction by the fact of electric vehicles. An accelerator is a totally logical thing to have an electric vehicle. A gas pedal is not. So looking from the outside in versus looking from the inside out helps you a lot building abstractions. Now, putting this back into the context of IT, here are two better examples. These are not lesser databases. These are new constructs. The one is a ledger database, we also call that change data capture, where every change in one database is captured in another database, right? That's something very useful and it's not like just a database with some settings fixed or even saying this is a database that's suitable for storing customer data. Now I'm giving these things meaning. This is domain driven design. I have a new language and this language is meaningful inside my organization. A database with customer data might mean something different in my organization than it does in another organization. So I mapped an understanding of my domain onto the core cloud services. And that's why DDD is so important. Now, a test you can apply here is a database with customer data is something the cloud providers cannot build because it's different for each organization. Now, they can give you all the bells and whistles, the dials they can give you to make this easy to do, but they cannot do that for you. So here's another good test for building a useful in-house platform, make services that by definition the cloud providers cannot provide, and your developers will be very happy that you did. But in order to do that, you need to understand what I call the business 
technical domain very well. What kind of databases are relevant in your business? It's still a technical thing. It's a database, but it also relates back to your business domain. You understand customers. You understand personal, personally identifiable information. So these are words out of your business domain. And the merger of those two make a good construct, a good domain construct for an in-house platform. So this makes a big, big difference. Difference. And that's why DDD is so important to make a good platform. Now, you have to remember that as a platform, you're essentially a wholesale customer of the base platform of the cloud, right? Because you're not using one cloud service, you're making cloud services available to many teams inside the organization. That's what I call wholesale you're basically retailing multiple instances of this within your organization so that makes you a rather special cloud customer and that's why my opening premise was that you do this wholesale so let's stick with the model of databases or it could even be kubernetes clusters so let's say you're selling databases so to speak as a platform team to many internal teams now how do you do this right most cloud services scale to the point where you could put all this in one table, right? You could give everybody a DynamoDB, a single DynamoDB table and just prefix their key with their project ID. This will actually work and you only have one database to manage or you use one database instance, but multiple tables. Each internal customer gets their own table, right? Could also be done or you give each customer a whole complete instance. Right? And there's obvious trade-offs here, right? You might have, in the first two, you might have noisy neighbors. You might run into quotas and limitations versus on the last one, you have to manage many different instances, right? And the same applies to Kubernetes cluster, right? How many of your customers do you put in one cluster or do you generate a cluster for each customer, but then you cannot apply universal version updates, for example. You would have to do this for each customer. So there's no easy answer here, but having these things fresh in your mind helps you design a good platform because you're now a wholesale customer and you need to figure out how you divvy up the wholesale services into retail products for your internal users. And that influences your architecture. Right? Building and turning platforms has a lot to do with architecture. So if you put this on in a single resource, right, you work through the controller of the cloud resource and internally, right, you can put all these things in one cloud resource. Basically, I call this pushing the multi-tenancy down, right? You could put everybody in one queue. You could put everybody in one EKS cluster. Or you could put everybody in one DynamoDB if you want to, right? And if you use it with namespaces, right, you're still dealing with one resource, but you don't have your own controller. You, and, you know, directly map this to the cloud instance. Or in the last example, you have to provision independent, not independent, you provision individual instances, but you have to manage those actively. So how much your platform has to do really depends on the model that you choose. At which level do you map tenancy like do you map this into the service into the service namespaces or do you do this in the platform just giving individual resources to everybody so wholesale being a wholesale customer suddenly becomes a very important consideration like if everybody's on the shared queue or the shared database you might have noisy neighbors right if somebody floods your queue everybody else will be waiting Cost allocations, right? Let's say this queue of this database costs you a certain amount of money. How do you split that cost out for your different tenants, right? Your retail customers of the platform. If you go the other end of the spectrum and everybody gets their own resource, that solves some of those problems. But now you're stuck with having to make version upgrades. I know of customers who have several hundred managed Kubernetes clusters like EKS clusters, but if there's a new Kubernetes release, they have to go and deal with 200 teams and update. If you have messaging platforms or event platforms, managing dependencies becomes very important. Suddenly you are a central element that deals with a lot of event producers and a lot of event consumers. So you need to manage dependencies. And of course, how do you make this available to 
the teams, right? Is this a console or more likely you make automation constructs, right? You let them provision one of those retail resources. I want a logical queue. And then your cloud automation needs to map that into the actual representation on the cloud underneath in one of the three models we discussed. So I hope this gave you some new thoughts on what it really means to build a platform from composition to abstraction to domain modeling in your platform and doing the whole thing in a wholesale model where you resell wholesale services throughout your organization. If you like this way of thinking, my book Platform Strategy is finally available both as an ebook and as a print book. So if you like these kind of thoughts, I highly encourage you to have a look there. And here's a QR code with a nice coupon to do so. Thanks for your attention and enjoy the rest of PlatformCon.